no buzz. A Just Bees book club. Um, ran across this a little while ago um, and uh, read it and had some extremely conflicted feelings about it. Um, this book is written from 77 to 80, published in 81. Um, it is the author's like first or second sci-fi novel, I think, maybe the first. Um, author is a famous composer, um, who, uh, makes operas and other things, um, I guess was the, uh, uh, conducting consultant on Tar, that movie that came out last year or two years ago or whatever that I did not see. Um, I'm going to unfortunately do a very bad job of pronouncing his name, um, but I looked it up and I'll, I'll try my best, I guess. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the episode about Starship and Haiku by Somto Suchartku, um, who seems like a fascinating person. Um, this book has some issues. <laughs> um, uh, for the first hundred or so pages, um, I really dug it, actually. Um, it wasn't, like, blowing me away or anything, but, like, the scene framing was pretty solid, and it's just nice sometimes to read a, a 70s sci-fi novel, right? Like, for me at least, there's a, there's a certain headspace that one gets into uh, with certain... Um, uh, periods of writing, um, and I've always been a fan of, uh, you know, just like mass market originals uh, in that period. Um, they all have their issues, but, you know, I'm like a big lover of, of Simak's work across the years. Um, love to just pick up a random science fiction book every once in a while like I did with this one, or rather my uh, co-worker did, and um, decided we should both read it. Um, it's very cute, very cute. Can't see that. Ooh. Um, yeah, first hundred or so pages. Uh, the, the sort of broad overview uh, before I get into some of the more specifics because I want to talk about them just because it's so fucking weird. Um, broad overview. Uh, there's a boy named Josh who's about ten years old when uh, nuclear holocaust happens. Basically, he lives in Hawaii. His mother is pregnant and gives birth the day that everything happens. Uh, then we cut to about 20 years later, for some reason, get into it. Um, uh, Josh and his brother Dee Dee are, uh, I guess Josh is like 30, and Dee Dee's like 20, but he still looks like he's a child, um, because he has a sort of developmental thing that's maybe also a psychic thing, you know, that trope. Um, and rounding out sort of the point of view characters, there is also well, there's, there's some of the some of the, the bad guys get point of view sections also, which is fun. But um, there's also Ryoko, who is like the son of one of the ministers in Japan, one of the only countries, or maybe the only country that did not get hit by this nuclear holocaust. So Japan is sort of functioning, if not um, doing great. Uh, so. The book takes place in like 2022, 2023, which is fun. Um, got a lot of things wrong. Didn't didn't get wrong that there would be a plague going around this year. That's fun. Uh, <laughs> whatever. Uh, yeah, and the sort of bits where you know uh, Josh is living in Hawaii. The, the the beaches have all been turned into mats of glass. Um, there's a lot of people who are having, uh, you know, kids born with uh, disabilities or um, mutations, sort of in the uh, in the parlance. I don't know what they call them, stranges, I think. Um, and so Josh is like involved in caretaking them. Um, and then like Ryoko goes by and they meet each other and there's like a sort of thing. Uh, there's precogs in this. Sorry, the, the, the word preaks shows up and immediately I was like, that's short for precognitive because this is a 1970s, early 80s science fiction novel. And that's sort of what I mean when I was just like, yeah, of course, this is, we are, we are, uh, we are, <laughs> um, we are simmering in our stew of tropes and I, 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 I enjoy the aroma. Um, it gets a little dicey, and so I'm going to talk about some things from this 1991 novel. Um, the... Here's the thing, okay. 
read the this is the thing that convinced me to to read this uh on, just above the author uh is a little little thing that says in the nuclear void of the 21st century man despaired until the whales began to sing um so yeah, there's, and you can't really, I mean, you can see the cover. There's like a weird space whale thing in, behind, a, behind a starship. Uh, the whales aren't space whales. They're just regular whales. Um, it just turns out the whales in our world have uh, a number of things about them. They can see um, at the atomic level, basically. Um, they can see sort of uh, all things. Um, they are uh, enlightened in some ways. Um, and they are also extremely driven toward the beautiful death. And here's where some stuff gets kind of weird and, um, frankly, uncomfortable to me. Because, uh, like said, uh, Josh is, is of Japanese descent, though he's born in Hawaii. Um, Ryoko, obviously, a Japanese person. Much of this book takes place in Japan. Um, sort of the big reveal about 100 pages or so in is that the Japanese people were born because whales dreamed them or dreamed an early human or like a precursor to human pregnant with whale DNA sort of collectively um, but led by one named whale whose name I'm not going to try to say because it's like four A's and an O and some T's and K's and E's um, this is weird because it dovetails with this book's sort of extremely essentialist views of Japanese people, specifically around beauty and Japanese people's, um, ability to find beauty in things that people of no other culture can. Um, it's first sort of, uh, brought out, I mean, this is where, this is haiku is all over this, of course, but it's sort of thematized within the book in this bowl that, uh, Josh's grand, di dying grandmother gifts him as a, like, a, a final goodbye, and he's like, well, this is ugly as shit, and then everyone who sees it, who is of, you know, with proper Japanese descent or a proper Japanese acculturation i guess but, but it's not acculturation because yeah whatever um because of the whale thing uh like absolutely goes fucking bonkers for uh, somebody commits ritual ritual suicide um because josh promises it to a different person for passage to japan like um and, it, and this is where it also dovetails right uh so there's a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh there's a bunch made about the beautiful death and um, specifically Japanese people's uh, inherent question mark. I don't think there's really a question mark given the, the what's happening in this book, but question mark, uh, sort of predilection towards the beautiful death, towards uh, suicide, and the whole sort of structure of the book from that point on is... Uh, these three ministers sort of took over Japan after um, everything happened, um, and they are sort of intentionally guiding people to commit suicide because of it being the end of the world or whatever. Um, and this gets sort of taken up, right? We read the back at this point. Um, it was an ancient heartbreaking tale that moved the survivors of the Millennial War to revive an honored ritual. But a self-appointed death lord, a man gone mad in the wake of chaos, vowed to create a living haiku with an exquisite final last line, the end of human life. Only one chance remains for those who listen to the music of Earth's great whales. They must honor the spirit of their ancestors and flee the planet before they are crushed by the grim, poetic, terrible vision of the death lord. Um, the death lord doesn't get named until like three quarters of the way through this book also. Um, and it, and then it's like presented as though it's going to be a big reveal at the end, like a, like a, oh, who could it be? But it's extremely obvious from how things have, have played out ahead of time to the point where like, it seems like, uh, it seems like Suchart could re realize this and just like, it's like, ah, oh, well, I was gonna, I was gonna pay it off later, but also it's like really obvious. So I'll just have 
a person name drop it or be like, well, I think it might be uh, uh, this guy. I've forgotten everyone's name. Um, I've, I've read, a lot, read a lot of books recently. Uh, I think it might be this guy. And it's like, yeah, it's obviously that guy. And then like 10 pages later, they're like, oh, it was me. As though it was a reveal, even though it pretty clearly telegraphed it from the beginning. Um, that's, those are whatever. That's fine. I, that uh, shit doesn't bother me at all, personally. But uh, it's kind of funny. Um, but yes, so these three ministers end up sort of orchestrating a cultural uh self genocide i don't know um which it is implied like uh it's not implied um there are in the world stereotypes about uh about japanese people and about how, how they are bound by honor and much more so than other uh in other cultures uh there these are stereotypes that are both used in you know uh in promoting japanese nationalism ethno-nationalism specifically and in uh denigrating uh people of japanese descent who are in diaspora and it sucks uh <laughs> um and specifically you know there's uh, you know we we have a loan word called seppuku um, in english uh, specifically around um, practices of of honor bound uh uh, death by suicide that are um, again ways of taking certain uh, facts on the ground and, and 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 elevating them into a sort of assumption about a people uh, and essentialism uh, of a culture uh, and I don't love that I think this book is uh, is like a pig and shit with that kind of stuff uh, a lot of the time and it was very uncomfortable to read. Um, if this had been written by a white person, I wouldn't have read it, period, I don't think. Um, and I, I'm not super familiar with the history of Thailand or, or Siam. Um, so, I don't I, In my very brief research, uh, it seems that uh, Japan sort of uh, semi-colonized them in during World War II. They, like, landed on... They, Siam... Um, I guess at that point it had it was Thailand. Um, Thailand was sort of neutral, but then Japan came in and they sort of had a they had a constitutional monarchy. So there was a sort of cult around, personality around the king. It was seemed sort of amenable to to fascism, but also like I guess the U.S. sort of declared that they were not going to declare war on Thailand because they considered them a puppet state of the Japanese Empire. So complicated history that I'm not familiar with, but, um, you know, not familiar with enough to speak on it any more than that, I suppose I should say. Um, which isn't to say I endorse any of those things. I don't endorse the United States and anything it does. Um, but yeah, uh, I guess the long and short of it is like, I like, I like goofy science fiction that swings real big. Uh, and sometimes the swings end up, you know, uh, reproducing ideas about uh, uh, certain uh, peoples. Um, and and to, to make it sort of clear, right, um, I've just been reading, like, Miru Yu, who's a, who's a, um, oh gosh, I've forgotten the word. Zainichi Korean? Um, the point I'm, 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 I'm getting at here, right, uh, is that the, uh, the idea of an origin myth of the Japanese people in which the, the Japanese people are all birthed of, uh, a particular person, uh, and, and therefore share, or like a, a whale, I guess I should say, um, and therefore sort of share, uh, this, this deep kinship is like, deeply dismissive of the Ainu people um, who lived in Japan before uh, Japan was colonized, um, of the uh, of the native folks on um, that place that the U.S. has a bunch of bases on, my brain is, is stopping, um, of, of the diasporas that are currently in Japan. Um, it, is a, it is an ethno-nationalist assumption about how the world works that also just like, don't, I don't fuck with it, right? <laughs> I just don't fuck with it. 
sort of uh, sort of the long and short of it. Um, and yeah, and the, and I feel like the writing does sort of at the same time as all of this sort of crypto nationalist assumptions or uh, I guess like stereotypes about uh, Japan sort of comes through in the story. Um, also, there's a starship that they're trying to get to. That's, you know, a big deal. Also, I, I, almost, I was just about to wrap up, but I didn't get to the thing I meant to say earlier, which is the 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 fact that um, Josh is 30 in this is like absolute nonsense. There is no way that this book wasn't written with him as a child and then it they turned him into an adult at some point. Just how he's written, he is 12. Like very, very, very clearly except for in the scenes when him and Ryoko have sex. Like, then he's written as a 30-year-old. And I I would put money down that this book was written, or conceptualized and, and written uh, without the first chapter that introduces the 1997 arc, that this kid was very young. Um, and then either Suchartku or an, uh, an editor was like, yo, we need a romance subplot here. And they just inserted a handful of scenes in which Ryoko and, and Josh kiss or whatever. Um, it, it, I cannot, I cannot imagine that it was any it is it was done in any other way. I mean, whatever, one can imagine many things. Um, but the, yes, this the protagonist of this book is a child who it occasionally reminds you is actually thirty years old, and it's like, no, no, he's not. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, the, the point being, um, that opening stuff, the stuff in Hawaii before they get to Japan, and I think is all just like written and framed better. Um, and it, the book kind of along with, after this reveal of the whales being the, the, the literal birthers of the Japanese people, um, the writing kind of just goes a little wonky from there. It's never bad. Um, I don't think it like fucks up anything super bad. I mean, I mentioned the thing about the Death Lord and its reveal, like, if that's a if that's a literary sin to you, I suppose that's that's truly bad. But like, who cares? Uh, mysteries are not interesting. <laughs> uh, um, uh, endings don't matter. Um, these are some some B rules. Um, but yeah, it just it doesn't really pick up, and it's deeply annoying um, for those who have listened to. On the matter of systems, you might recall the episode that me and BW did on, um, I said, I have no mouth and I must design, uh, the sort of uh, game design essay by Greg Kostikian. Um, when I was looking at this book, one of the only things I found uh, was on the Wikipedia page for it, there is a quote that's a review from Greg Kostikian. Um, and if you've heard that episode, you'll know that both me and BW have very mixed feelings about uh, Kostikian as a as a writer. Um, not like pretty positive on him as a thinker, but um, he has a he has a tone that is sometimes frustrating. Um, and it was and this was very frustrating because uh, Kostikian's review was fun fundamentally basically like good book, pretty solid prose. Or not good book, but it was like big ideas, solid prose. Like I'm excited to check out this author's next book, or like you should keep an eye out because he he seems to have a lot of promise. And like that's kind of it's kind of just exactly right. It's just correct. Like I I feel like I might pick up another Sutrid Code novel at some point and have it be something that I you know I doubt anything he's he wrote based on this is gonna like you know, take that take take a top five slot in my favorite books of all time kind of deal. But I bet I bet I could have a really good time with some of his other writing, um, especially if it, it tightens up a little in the back half and does a little less essentialism. Anyway, that was a much more comprehensive set of thoughts than I thought I was going to have about this book. Thanks for not watching. Peace.